start recording the last time, we, I introduced this idea of finding area. Thank you so much. I introduced this idea of approximating areas for any shape. And then I quickly said this is a difficult task. And although, and it is also very important as a task. Uh, and so then I quickly went to an example where we knew a nice expression for the boundary of an area. So today I'm going to give a more general idea uh, for how this thing is done. And from the example last time, you'll see how it sort of fits into this general thing as a special example, special case of something that you can do. Okay, so if I draw any any function here, so this will be f of x, something that you can find the, the height to, given any x value, the function tells you the height. If I then ask you to compute what the area is from some starting number here in the domain of the function to some end value in the domain of the function, between the function itself and the x-axis, that area would look something like this. All of this in here. If I ask you to approximate that, then what we did last time was we constructed rectangles all of the same width, all of the uniform width. And I'm going to present here briefly various ways that you can do that. So let's fix there are n rectangles. So approximate the area bounded by x equals a, b, and y equals 0 and f of x. Okay, so that's saying from left to right, x equals a to b. And from up and down, x, sorry, y equals nothing, that's the x-axis, and y equals the height of this. So this sort of rectangular type thing is the area that we're going to try to approximate <coughs> with n rectangles. I say instead of using just four or five or eight or whatever it is, we're going to pick n of them. The uniform width of these rectangles. Always has the same form. Okay, so if you want to know right away how wide each rectangle will be, it's always going to be the length of this line segment divided by the number of rectangles you're using. Okay. Last time I think I used four rectangles or eight rectangles. But this is always going to be the uniform width of the rectangle. Last time that was because the length was from 0 to 1, it was 1 over 4 or 1 over 6 or whatever it was, I don't, I don't recall. And there was no sound, so I can't hear myself say it. Okay. Now I have to pick something to draw, so I'm going to pick, um, I'll pick 4 for this drawing. Okay, but really this is for any number. If I pick four rectangles, that means I take this interval and I divide it into four equal pieces. How wide each of those are is exactly that value. Okay. So the width here is delta x for all of these. This is the whole thing that I said last time about uniform width. 
all exactly the same way, which is exactly this number minus this number divided by how many rectangles I'm going to put in. Okay? And there are various choices for how tall the rectangles can be. Okay, so there are various choices. I'll So I'm going to just take this one little interval here, and I'm going to extend both sides up. And I'm not going to make a choice at this moment. Uh, and I'll also do it for over here at that point, just so we can see some obvious choices. So last time, I think I first showed you something called left end point. I never know where to put this dash. I'm going to say left and the dash point heights. So I'll draw that in blue. And I'll draw that in this interval over here. So if I have a little interval here, and I'm going to draw a rectangle above this, if I pick whatever height the function is at the left end point of this interval, then the rectangle that I get is as tall as the function on the left of this interval. Okay, so this blue one is a left end point rectangle. It has the height of the function at the left part of that interval. That's different from a right end point. Up here on the far right interval. So we have this one here. And if I pick the height of the rectangle to be however tall the function is on the right side of this little interval, then the height of our rectangle is going to be over here. And this is going to be the rectangle that represents the area underneath the curve in that interval. And now I think you can guess there's an infinite number of choices as well in between. Right? But one to make a note of is something called the midpoint. Height. Where you take your interval. And these ones are. Oh, maybe I'll draw it in this, this interval here because it's nice and obvious. You take the interval. You split it in half, okay? And then you draw a rectangle that is as tall as the function at that midpoint of the interval. Which would give you this rectangle. Now right now you might suggest that one of these is always going to be a best choice for approximating the area. All right, it certainly looks like in this example that the blue left end point height rectangle underestimates by a lot. The green one overestimates by a lot. And this midpoint one overestimates here but underestimates here and it looks like it balances off pretty good, right? It's unfortunate that we can't say that the optimal choice, no matter what your function, is the midpoint. You can't say that. Okay? Uh, but that certainly would be great. So now my question is, no matter what your choice is, left, right, or midpoint, what is the general form for the intervals, uh, the rectangles in each interval? So it's just going to be the height of the function at your choice, so I'm going to write C. 
C is going to be one of these x values, either the left end point value, the right end point value, or the midpoint value. So for this blue rectangle, what is C? It's A. I plugged in A to get the height because my choice was the left end point of this interval, and the left end point of this interval is the number A. What is C for my green rectangle over here? Well, the green rectangle was the right end point height rectangle, which means I took an interval, I took the right end point of it, and plugged that into my function. So C for this rectangle is B. For the dotted line black rectangle here, which is at the midpoint, it's going to be exactly B plus whatever number this is, divided by 2. Okay, so whatever your choice is, it's one of these three things, or honestly anything in the interval, right? Um, that's the height of the rectangle, and what's the width of all the rectangles? Delta x. They're all the same. So this is a general formula for the area of any one rectangle, and in order to add all of them up, I'm going to just label these choices for each interval. My choice in interval 1 is C sub 1. My choice in interval 2 is C sub 2. My choice in interval 3 is C sub 3. And my choice in interval 4 is C4. Right? So now these guys, F, at each of those choices, times the width, this represents all the rectangle heights, times their widths, and this means add all of them up, starting with my first rectangle and all the way to my end rectangle. And now this is a general form for what the approximate area under that curve is, using any number of rectangles, and any choice of height within each interval. Okay? Questions about this before I move on? Because we're, we're about to see some examples of this played out using various endpoints. And then we're going to construct some limits from them, and maybe even evaluate one or two to find a real area. Okay. So let's redo what we did last time. Just we'll, we'll go real fast through it. Let's say I pick n rectangles. with n rectangles, the area under x squared under from, and I'm just going to change it slightly, uh, no I won't, we'll just do x equals 0 to 1 again. So what is our general formula? Well first we need to pick left end points, or right end points, or mid points. I don't care which. You want to do left end points? That's always easy. Okay, so we will choose, see eyes are going to be the left end points. While I'm erasing and drawing the graph, what is delta x? So 
I'm going to take this 0 to 1 interval, break it up into n pieces. So how wide is each rectangle going to be? 1 divided by n. 1 divided by n. Perfect. And if we're picking left end points, what will the heights of each rectangle be? So let's, let's like pick two real quick for n and just check what we think. So if I pick two rectangles to use, and I'm picking the left end point, how tall is the first rectangle? Zero. The left end point of this interval is here. How tall is the function there? It's not. Zero height. Okay. So the height is zero. How about in the next rectangle, how tall will this one be? It'll be what I get when I plug in one half. And that gives us f at one half, right? So real quick, let me write it suggestively like this, f of 0 over 2, f of 1 over 2. Okay, let's increase n. We'll use four rectangles, which means we're going from 1 fourth, 0 to 1 fourth, 1 fourth to 1 half, 1 half to 3 fourths, 1 is 4 fourths, one half is two fourths. Oops. And what will the heights of the rectangles be in all of these? Taking the left end points, we have again the height at the left end point of this one is f at zero. For this interval, the height is going to be however tall this is, which is f at one fourth. The height for this one is f at one half, which is f at two fourths. For this one, the height will be whatever height we have here, which is f at three-fourths. If we recognize what's going on here, we're going to start counting at zero, go up to one, go up to two, go up to three, and we're going to stop there. We're going to stop at one less than how many rectangles we've got. We're going to start at zero. We're going to stop at four minus one, or n minus one in this case. And what we plug into our function is i divided by the number of rectangles, no matter how many we have. Right, we see that? We've plugged in 0, which is 0 over 4, into our function to find the height 0. We plugged in 1 over 4 to find this height. We plugged in 2 over 4 to find the height here. We plugged in 3 over 4 to find this height. So the top number starts at 0, ends at 3 for us, because we picked 4 rectangles. 4 minus 1 is 3. And the width of all of them is 1 over 4. Okay? But we know our function here. It's x squared. So we can just plug this in. Right? i squared over n squared times 1 over n. Right? Okay. Simplifying that just a little bit. If you want to find out exactly what the area is for x squared underneath x squared using left endpoints, then this is the sum you do. Take any number of rectangles, like a trillion or five billion, doesn't matter. That's less, I understand, than a trillion, but 
get the idea. That's what you do. You just run through the number 0 to 1 less than your end number. You square those numbers and divide them by the cube of how many total rectangles there are each time. Just add all of those up. That's something that the computer can do very quickly for you. Right? But this is with left end points being chosen. Right? Had we chosen right end points, this would change a little bit. Specifically, these things could be changed. We would instead be picking the function height at 1 fourth, and then at 2 fourths, and then at 3 fourths, and then at 4 fourths. So we would just start at i equals 1 and go up to i equals m. If we chose midpoints, it'd be altogether different. Right? We'd actually have to, like, figure out what to plug in. We couldn't just use some nice little counts of 1 over n. But we could do that too. And this is the process you do to approximate the area underneath most nice functions with rectangles. Okay? And this is not something that I had a chance to do, I think, in class. But what happens if we keep subdividing and keep subdividing forever. We keep drawing rectangles in of smaller and smaller widths. With this function, what, what definitely happens before long? Before long, the area of all of our little rectangles very precisely measures the area under the curve, right? Like, really closely. If I asked you, hey, find me the area to within one trillionth, so you need to be that close or I won't accept it, you could tell me exactly how many rectangles you need to use, actually. And then you could perform the computation for me. So that's, that's a practice that you'll... <coughs> you're being asked to do in the homework actually is given a choice of left end point, right end point, mid point, some function and some interval approximate the area of a given function. Okay? And this is generally how you do it. Questions about how that works and how that's run. I'll do one more example and then we'll sort of end it, end this section. is <clears throat> this one. In your mind, go ahead and think about what you think that looks like. E to the negative x. So in this one, um, your book wants you to go all the way. They, they give you this function and they say, don't just approximate it, tell me the exact area. So we're going to use this example to see what that means. And uh, they suggest to use right endpoints.
So what's the first thing we do? <clears throat> do you know of a formula for specifically the area underneath this type of shape? The answer is no, right? Unless you're like really advanced students and I don't you haven't like made yourself known yet. Okay, we need to approximate it. And you need to approximate it in a way that you can get as close as you can to this actual area. And that's exactly what we did over there, right? As I explained, if you pick more and more rectangles, you get closer and closer and closer to the actual value, the actual area. With the questions asking you for the area, you need to take the limit of those things. So, given a function, given an interval, you need to construct your approximation using n rectangles of uniform width. Then, put it into the sum for all of that, right? That's the approximation. Then, take the limit as n goes to infinity. Right? Perfect. All right. So here's the first start. How wide are the rectangles if we pick n of them? So let there be n rectangles. How wide are they? They are exactly Two minus zero over n equals two over n. They're exactly two over n units wide. Right? And now I haven't drawn a picture or anything yet, but that always can help if you want. Hold on. I want it to be this just a little bit more uh, no. uh, not drawn out for you. I want to for you to think about what is x at the right end point for each of the intervals. Does that make sense? It's like in the first interval that we create between 0 and 2, we've got n little intervals. What is the right end point of that first little interval? We take this interval 0 to 2. We're going to draw a bunch of rectangles, and each of them is going to have the height equal to whatever we get when we plug in for each of these intervals the right end point. So we take 0 to 2, we divide it into 10 pieces, and we construct rectangles above using function values at the right end point for our height. So what is what is this first x value? How wide is the first rectangle? That's the question. 2 over n, right? And we started at 0. So 0, 2 over n to the right. First right end point is 2 over n. What's the next right end point? Two over n plus one. Not quite. Not quite. How many how many intervals have we gone through to get to this point? Mm -hmm. Two of them, and each of them are exactly that wide. And we're starting at zero. 
So 0, 1, 2 over n, 2, 2 over n's, right? 2 times 2 over n is what that is. 2 over n plus 2 over n. And now you see we can go all the way down this line. 3, 2 over n's. 4, 2 over n's. Dot, dot, dot. And the last endpoint is exactly here in the last interval, right? This is after going through all n of them. Here's the first, here's the second, here's the third, here's the fourth. We go through n intervals and we arrive here, and this value is exactly n times 2 over n, because we've gone through n of these intervals, each of width 2 over n. And it's no mistake that n times 2 over n equals 2, the very, very last point. Yeah? So our right end point always has a special little form to it. It's got a counting one of these, two of these, three of these, four of these. We start by plugging in 1, 2 over n to our function. We then plug in 2 times 2 over n to our function. And we go down the list until we get to the nth thing. So the right endpoints have this form. i times 2 over n, where i starts at 1 and ends at n. Right? So here's the general form for our choice of point for the function height, given a width delta x. And it actually agrees with what we've sort of written down here. So this sum is going to start at i equals 1, and at i equals n, we're going to plug in to our function i times 2 over n, to get the height of our function at the right end point of each interval, and then we're going to multiply that function height times 2 over n, which is the width of every rectangle. And that's going to give us the approximate area underneath this function using exactly n rectangles of uniform width. So we write in exactly what our function is, e to the negative x, with this for x. So e to the negative i times 2 over n times 2 over n. Uh, yes. Yep. Okay. Have we answered the question yet? Have we found the area under the curve? So if I drew this out right now, what we've got is here's our function from zero to two. We divided this up into n intervals, all of the same width. We picked the right endpoints, drawn in these rectangles. We computed their areas, and we've added up all those rectangular areas. That's where we're at right now. Do we have the exact area yet? Definitely not. What do we need more of? More rectangles. So how do we get as many rectangles as possible? We do this. We let n become bigger. Bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Until we've got an infinite number of them, and each of them is infinitely thin. Essentially, using vertical lines stacked right on top of each other to compute the actual area. 
That's done, that's accomplished by taking the limit as n goes to infinity of that sum. That's what the limit does, right? It looks at the pattern in this process of letting this number go to this. So you start at 1 and see what you get. You start at 2, see what you get. You go up to 5,000, you see what you get. You go up to 50,000, you see what you get. Eventually, you're going to start seeing a pattern that you're going to start narrowing in on a number. And that number that you're going to eventually zero in on is the limit. And the limit is the exact area you're looking for. Fantastic result, right? Okay, now go out into the world, find functions, and compute the areas between them and the ground, right? Great. That is my favorite hobby. I, all the I do this all the time. I carry around like little pieces of string with me, and I'm always like, they're, you know, they're very thin, so I just like stack them up, and I just, a trillion, a trillion rectangles. No, but really, like, with a photograph, you can estimate areas underneath things like the St. Louis Arch. Why not? Fun little thing to do. Take a picture. Use some proportionality constant because you see a person that's exactly five foot three standing next to it, so that's exactly that size, and the, you know, you can find out areas like this for fun. For, for yes, exactly. F U M fun. <laughs> what do you do in your spare time for fun? I mean, come on. This is calculus, by the way. Um, or perhaps I don't know, you, you do something more with your time. I don't know. That's probably what I guess. Questions about how this works, though? There's a lot of details, aren't there? It's a process. Definitely a process. It's great that with certain functions, the result of this process are other known and easily found functions. You know what we call them? Antiderivatives. Every time I've asked you, hey, here's a function, what's its antiderivative? You've literally been doing this. And now all of you are like feeling really good about yourselves, right? Because you're like, man, I had no idea I was taking limits of sums of products that are infinitely long. It's crazy. Well, you were. And these antiderivatives tell you about things like areas underneath functions. This is the entire chapter, integrals. We're finding the functions which give us areas underneath certain curves. Namely, we're finding antiderivatives and evaluating them and seeing how the evaluation of them at certain points gives you these exact areas. No approximation necessary, it's just the area, period. But as a fallback, if you've got a function which you don't know the antiderivative of, you have to do this. Yes, Gwen. Um, so how many of those little rectangles should we make or should we always do it to infinity? Oh, well it depends. Depends, right? You go to the blacksmith, you go to a, a shop, and you're like, I need a part that has these tolerances. Let's say the part needs to look like a square and needs to be about two centimeters on an edge, but you say plus or minus 0.1 centimeters. He's like, no problem. I'll just throw it on the old machine. I can give you that precision no matter what. But then you come back a day later and you say, this part doesn't fit. I need this tolerance. And he says, I don't have a laser. I can't make you that part. Okay, like, how many rectangles you choose depends on how tolerant you are. How close to the actual area do you want to be? That's how you choose the number of rectangles. That's also how you choose what you plug in here. You can inspect the function 
you can determine is choosing the midpoint the best? Is choosing rectangles the best? Sometimes people go through a lot, a lot of effort for some given curve. Instead of using rectangles, what do you call those things? It's not a rectangle anymore. I've taken this right side and I've thrown it up there. Sometimes the top is the average slope and the equation of the line between the endpoints. You can go through a lot of trouble to find integrals like that, and that's a lot more accurate with fewer rectangles than just using rectangles. Sometimes it's more efficient to use the parabolic shape at the top. Sometimes it's more efficient to not use this integral at all. And there's functions where this integral, as we've described it, can't work ever, but there's other types of integrals which are defined differently, which can work in those special situations. Yeah. This one's called a Riemann integral, developed by Bernard Riemann. So there's others, like Lebesgue integrals, developed by Henri Lebesgue, which complement each other in various situations. Yeah, okay, that's it. No other questions? If not, we'll press on. 20 minutes. Know the antiderivative, by the way. This was on your quiz. This will tell you what that sum over there is. What do you take the derivative of to get this? Let me change it. What do you take the derivative of to get that? And what changes if you've got a negative sign in there and you take its derivative? Chain rule applies and you take the derivative of this, which is negative 1, and now you've got yourself the antiderivative of that. This guy tells you the area underneath this curve. So forget the limit. Use this guy. This is such a fundamental result, we're going to call it so in a little bit. But definitely not today. Or perhaps I misspoke. No, definitely not today. I don't think we call it that by, for a few days. So. Anyway, today, 5.2. We get rid of this approximate. 5.1 approximating area. Let's get rid of approximating. Let's cut to the chase and just give the actual area. Okay, that's the whole idea of this. We call this the definite. I probably misspelled that. I think that's right. Definite integral. Integral as a word means the area underneath the curve. You're finding an integral, you're finding the area under a curve. The definite integral is not an approximate area. It's not an approximate integral. It is the area. With arbitrary precision, perfectly measuring the area underneath the curve. We saw right there at the end that if you take the limit as n goes to infinity of this sum, where x 
maximize your choice of the height in an interval i, and you multiply the areas of every ith interval, uh, ith rectangle rather, and you find all those and you add them all up. This limit for certain functions gives you a perfect approximation of your area. Okay? So now I've said for some functions. This is a perfect approximation. So that leads me to this next definition of the definite integral. It's a lot of words, so here we go. If f is a function, so that's a big one. So lot, lots of things that we've seen that aren't functions, right? Like Non-functions exist all over the place in the world, so like circles, for example, non-function. So this is already pretty big. We cut out quite a lot of things that we cannot do this for. Okay, if f is a function defined for x within a and b, that just means that uh, the interval a to b is in the domain of our function f. In other words, I can give you any starting number and any ending number, and you can tell me what the value of the function is, what the height of the function is for any of those numbers in between, right? Okay? We subdivide, divide rather, they say, the interval from the start to the end into n subintervals, like we've done before, <coughs> describing the process that we've done so far, of equal width. Now width is exactly b minus a over n. Define that as delta x, like we've done. So given a function, Find on some interval, we just divide it into the interval into n subintervals of equal width. That's what we've done. We let x0 equal a. So we're going to list out a bunch of numbers that we're going to plug into our function. Be less than x1, be less than x2, less than dot dot dot, less than x n equaling the right of our endpoint. These were like the left endpoints and the right endpoints before. Right? So we take our intervals, they have a left side and a right side. And so x0 to x1 is our first interval. x1 to x2 is our next interval, etc. etc. We're just partitioning up our interval a to b. So these endpoints of our n intervals or subintervals. So that x i star explain this in just a second, lies in the ith subinterval xi to xi, excuse me, minus 1 to xi. I'm just quickly explaining this. I said there was lots of choices of what number to plug in to get the height of your function, right? You can pick the left interval, endpoint. So that would mean xi star is xi minus 1. I said you can pick the right 
endpoint. That means we've chosen xi. But what this says is you can pick anything in between these two. Literally anything. Midpoints, left endpoints, right endpoints, third quartile point, first quartile point, anything. Then, the definite integral of f from a to b is written like this. Borrow some words here from someone that said this a day or two ago. Big squiggly, A to B, F of X, DX. So the definite integral of F of X from A to B. That's how you read this. So you see something like this. This is a big stretched out S, by the way. Okay, if, you, if you just wrote like a little S next to it, wow. wrote an S, maybe your S's look normal. Mine certainly don't. If you draw an S below it or above it, whatever, and you just grab the top and bottom and stretch it out, that looks like this, right? Kind of. Okay, why S? What is this thing? It is the limit, and then goes to infinity of a sum. <coughs> S for sum. It's an infinite sum. It's an infinite series is something you'll learn in calculus too. So the definite integral of f of x from a to b is this. How do you find it right now? You do this. Exactly what we've done. And it tells you the area underneath f of x from a to b between the function and the x-axis. But there's a caveat here. This doesn't always work. So if this limit doesn't exist, you can't say that this is the integral. And as I've said, there's a whole lot of things where that limit does not exist. So a couple notes. This thing is called the integral sign. So that's an integral. If you see that little stretched out S, that's an integral. A to B, these guys here, we call these the lower and the upper limits of our integral, not to be confused with the actual process that we're doing, which are the limits. So the upper end point or the lower end point, the upper limit, the lower limit. This thing inside here, we call this the integrand. It's that which will be integrated. And this, you know, what do you call it, dx's or dy's? It starts with the same letter. Mm, close. A derivative is two of these guys in quotient. Differentials dx is our differential. And what do these things represent from the sum? At the very end, there we've got this delta x, right? 
delta x represents the width of our rectangle. And what happens as the number of rectangles goes to infinity? Those things start shrinking to nothing, no width. This is essentially like the width of an infinitely thin rectangle. Dx, you can literally think of it as like that delta x but taken to the limit where it goes to nothing. F of x, that's just the height of the function where this rectangle is. It doesn't matter what endpoint you choose because you don't have an endpoint anymore. You have a single point in your interval because you've got an infinitely thin rectangle. So you take that string of width dx, you multiply it by the length of that string, f of x, and you sum all those up from this to that. If you can do this, so if the limit exists, we say f is integrable or integrable. It's just another sort of vocabulary term there. And I can't erase anything at this point. So if you don't have all that down, keep writing. about any of this. Mostly definitions and new symbols for you. Okay, trivia question. What if this limit doesn't exist? What do we say to that, about that function? It's not. Integrable. Not integrable. Yeah. Okay, so if the limit exists, it's integrable. If the limit doesn't exist, it's not integrable. Do you know of any functions where perhaps this limit won't exist? Absolutely. And they're not difficult to think of. Do you remember things called asymptotes, vertical asymptotes? Pick any function with a vertical asymptote and try and compute that limit. And tell me if it's a definite number, if it's well defined or not. shown before, right there, that's a finite amount of area. It's definite. So if you were to integrate from 0 to 1, x squared, you're going to get a finite number. I.e. x squared is integrable from 0 to 1. Is that a finite amount of area? See, now we've got some problems, don't we? I saw one person saying, yeah, because I'm guessing you're thinking, well, while it does go up to infinity at zero, this function, it gets infinitely thin at zero, right? Maybe the, the interplay there between how tall it gets and how thin those rectangles gets forces this area to be a finite number. Unfortunately, that's not the case. This is not integrable from 0 to 1 because of that asymptotic value and the rate at which 1 over x goes up. 
to compute this, you need the antiderivative of it, right? Ooh, what's the antiderivative of 1 over x? Right, and what's the natural log of 0? Negative infinity. Oh, there goes all that area. Right, right. So you can see this. If you started summing up these guys, you would see that you're getting this sum, which is called the harmonic series. The harmonic series does not converge, meaning this infinite limit doesn't come to a definite number. Okay, two minutes left. So, uh, the next thing we were going to do is inspect what this means. That's exactly what we've done. We we're going to do some examples. We're going to inspect how continuity plays a role in this. Yeah, lots of things. Okay, we're going to continue this next time. There's no point in proceeding any further. So, have a great weekend. Next week, Monday.